I did it. I, Gilbert Farwind, have become king of everything. Kraken's rule. This is going to be a long, 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 prosperous reign. Gilbert Farwind is dead, murdered by Gilly. And for some reason, that Kraken is attacking a replica of a Star Destroyer. Oh my god, that's so awesome. Kraken versus a Star Destroyer? Fuck yeah! It's like symbolic and stuff. We need to try Gilly for her crimes. I have gathered a 100% impartial council. Welcome, Gilly's sister, Gilly's other sister, Gilly's other sister, Gilly's cousin, Gilly's best friend, Gilly's aunt, Gilly's advisor, Gilly's handmaid, Gilly's mechanic, Gilly's dentist, Gilly's tax attorney, the woman who mows Gilly's lawn, Gilly's mailwoman, and the Prince of Dorn. Let the justice begin. And our episode begins with Tyrion walking, and walking, and walking. You know, they just had to rush this season. There was just no time. Fun fact, seven and a half minutes of this episode are dedicated to Tyrion walking in silence. That's what, one third of the runtime of a sitcom? Well, to be fair, this is a much bigger joke. Anyway, Kit Harrington then stumbles upon Grey Worm executing prisoners. He tries to stop him, and Grey Worm says that these were free men who chose to fight for Cersei. Free, huh? I think someone needs to explain how feudalism works to Grey Worm. And the showrunners. Tyrion then heads down to the catacombs, which have somehow mysteriously healed since last episode. I mean, I seem to remember all of these arches collapsing in a domino fashion. But nope, it's all back together again. Who knew that all Jaime and Cersei needed to do is hide underneath the dragon skull? Whatever the case, Tyrion then defies astronomical probabilities and finds a needle in a haystack. There's Jaime. Wow, Tyrion and Euron have a sixth sense in that they can locate Jaime with ease. Are they all Highlanders? Well, you know, there is something about Jaime Lannister that makes him easy to find. It doesn't matter if he's hanging out on a Dornish beach or trying to sneak through army lines or sitting on the bottom of a lake. If you want to find Jamie Lannister, you can find him. I mean, unless you're Amelia Clark, who was like 60 feet away. Anyway, Jamie and Cersei's bodies are easily uncovered and impossibly preserved after being crushed by thousands of tons of brick. Their plot armor extending well beyond death. We then get to Wolverine, who's- Whoa, 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 whoa. Where the hell is her horse? Yeah, um, you got me. And wasn't she riding out of the city, like away from the Red Keep? I think so. So they ended last episode with this weird, jarring Equus Ex Machina, with everyone scratching their heads, and then they just removed that element? Why? Why include the horse in the fucking first place? Tyrion even walks by the friggin' horse girl's dead body earlier in the episode. But now we're supposed to forget that Arya was last seen riding off on a mysterious horse? Did the writers of episode 5 even talk to the writers of episode 6? What was the point of the goddamn horse? Well, I mean, what was the point of Kinvara, or Kit Harrington riding a dragon, or friggin' time travel? At this point, we just have to accept that there are a million crucial things that are just never going to be explained. Like how D&D were given a Star Wars trilogy. Anyway, Kit Harrington makes it to the Red Cape to find Amelia Clark, and somehow Grey Worm has beaten him there? By, like, a lot? I mean, Kit Harrington specifically left Grey Worm to find Amelia Clark, but when he finds her, Grey Worm's already there. What the hell was he doing in the meantime? Did he stop to take a dump? And then we get this shot, and I can just imagine the writer's room. So, uh, Arya was, uh, on a horse. Ugh, do we have to deal with the horse? I mean, we never dealt with those dogs and no one noticed. Dude, I got this idea. Like, Amelia Clark will be walking, but then there'll be this dragon behind her, and then the wings will be up, and then it'll look like Amelia Clark has wings, and it'll be awesome! Yeah, yeah, sure, why not? What were we talking about? I think we were talking about how we need more scenes of Tyrion walking. Anyway, Amelia Clark then makes a big stump speech to her followers about how the war isn't over and how they need to continue to break the wheel. The metaphor is not exactly great. One would think that once one breaks the wheel, you wouldn't have to keep breaking it. Nonetheless, everyone is super excited, and I'm sure this motivation will be enduring. Anyway, Kit Harrington, Wolverine, and Tyrion watch on, acting like they understand High Valyrian. Tyrion's inability to speak is a running joke, and we have no evidence that Kit Harrington or Wolverine ever studied the language. I guess they have Duolingo or something. By the way, do the Dothraki even understand High Valyrian? Are there translators everywhere? It did occur to me that Amelia Clark's army is not really structured for big motivational speeches. 
Whatever, it all doesn't matter. Look how far away she is from everyone. The only thing people are hearing is wind and horse whinnying. Anyway, Tyrion then walks in and declares, You can't fire me. I quit. And Amelia Clark gives him a look that says, Oh, I can fire you. And Wolverine is suddenly there, and she tells Kit Harrington that Amelia Clark is bad, and that she knows a killer when she sees one. Keen eye, Wolverine. Keen eye. I'm glad that assassin's training helped you notice the 500,000 dead bodies. Anyway, Wolverine says that Amelia Clark needs to die because she's going to kill Sandra for refusing to kneel. Of course, Sandra would likely die if she refused to kneel to any monarch she wasn't related to, but whatever. And then we go to Kit Harrington visiting Tyrion in jail, and Tyrion tells Kit Harrington that Amelia Clark needs to die because of what she sounded like when she was addressing her soldiers. Again, neither speaks High Valerian. Kit Harrington protests and says she's not her father, and Tyrion begins to outline all the evil people that she killed and how she is becoming more confident in her rightness. And from that, Tyrion thinks that Amelia Clark will start killing everyone. Yeah, this is not exactly the best logic. Don't get me wrong, killing all the innocent people in King's Landing was horrible and inexcusable. But in no way did this have anything to do with Amelia Clark being convinced she was right. She just did it. And if a ruler's conviction is the problem, why does Tyrion later recommend the Brand 9000? He seems to have conviction in spades. Anyway, Tyrion says that he knows Kit Harrington loves Amelia Clark, and Kit Harrington says that love is the death of duty. And that's a season one reference. <laughs> And Tyrion counters that duty is the death of love. And we are in Yoda gibberish territory. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. You can play this gibberish game all day with any words and sound super deep. Just take an abstract concept, send it in some sort of general direction, and then it becomes another abstract concept. Dignity is the peak of ambition. Empathy is the rise of community. The internet is the gravedigger of fascism. My toilet is the death of duty. Duty is the death of my toilet. Next, we get to Kit Harrington heading to the Red Keep, and we find out that the showrunners don't understand anything about snow. Has any of them ever experienced a single snowfall? I thought they all spent time in Iceland. We just saw Drogon like 15 minutes ago, and now he's completely covered? The snow is accumulating that fast, because there's like a quarter inch of snow on the ground, and Kit Harrington is walking around with no problem. The piles of rubble are only lightly dusted, but this living, high-metabolism, fire-breathing dragon is completely covered. How did this scene happen? Uh, yeah, so I think Maisie Williams needs more screen time. Um, we could have her tell John that Danny is a killer. Isn't that obvious? Dude, I got this idea for a cool scene. Kid Harrington is walking around, and there's piles of snow, and then one of them will be Drogon! Fuck yeah! Yeah, uh, why not? What were we talking about? I have no idea. So next we get Amelia Clark finally experiencing her House of the Undying vision. Where those visions came from exactly? Who the fuck knows? All we know is that it was vitally important for someone or something to send Amelia Clark this moment in time. It completely changed everything. Well, hold on, Brandon. Let's try to make an argument for it. So this moment matches Amelia Clark's vision. So perhaps it strengthened her resolve about being right, and so when Kit Harrington comes in and talks to her, she seems overly confident and nuts. He had no idea that she just received divine confirmation of her actions. Who would want to engineer all of that? A time-traveling Bran? The Bran 9000 planned it all! I mean, why bother? If Kit Harrington didn't kill Amelia Clark, I'm pretty sure Wolverine would have. Right, but then Kit Harrington would be king. He needed Kit Harrington to disqualify himself by committing regicide to pave the way for the Brand 9000. Right, but if the Brand 9000 is that powerful, why not just time travel warg Drogon and roast them both? Huh. Yeah, that would be a lot easier. Anyway, then in one of the most comically absurd scenes ever put to film, Drogon chooses to not kill Kit Harrington, but instead melts down the Iron Throne. Yep. That's right, the dragon understands the perils of war and the evils of monarchical rule. Who knew that Drogon had been writing a fifth grade book report? How on earth did this happen? So, how are we gonna have Jon survive this scene? Well, I was thinking heavy-handed symbolism. Really? Guys, I just came up with the most awesome scene! So, Drogon is about to kill Kit Harrington, and then, out of friggin' nowhere, Ghost will jump out and will bite Drogon's eye, and Kit Harrington will be like, 
You followed me down here. And Drogon will be all angry. And then out of nowhere, Nymeria will jump out and bite the other eye. And then she'll have her whole wolf pack and it'll be like hundreds of wolves. And they'll like smother the dragon, biting it to death. Oh my god, can you imagine anything more awesome? Yeah, um, the heavy-handed symbolism works for me. Drogon then flies off with Amelia Clark's body, and since no one was around to witness the murder, we have to assume that Kit Harrington was dumb enough to march right up to Grey Worm and confess his crimes. And then we jump to weeks later for an end-all of end-all illogical scenes. This is the finale. Why wouldn't one think it would all end this way? Let's keep in mind that Grey Worm has, by far, the most powerful army in Westeros. Not to mention he has somewhat of an alliance with the Prince of Dorne and the Ironborn, who has the only fleet that we know of. Grey Worm holds all of the cards, and he wants justice for Tyrion, a traitor who conspired to kill his queen, and Kit Harington, who killed his queen. And one would think that with the death of Amelia Clark, the Unsullied and Dothraki would go into a blind rage and start slaughtering everyone in Westeros. After all, they did that to King's Landing over the death of Missande, so one would think that the death of Amelia Clark would lead to much, much more. In continuing war was Amelia Clark's last speech. She gave it to a rowdy crowd who all seemed quite bullish on the idea. Yeah, I can't make much sense of this. Is Amelia Clark suddenly the Night King? Does killing her cause everybody else to collapse? Plus, didn't they have a take-no-prisoner policy earlier in the episode? I'm supposed to believe that the Unsullied and the Dothraki wouldn't have immediately executed Tyrion and Kit Harington. Whatever, I guess it's their way now to coolly keep prisoners alive and assemble the worst Great Council ever. Grey Worm wants justice, and I can't even make this shit up. He decides the best way to get it is to make a council of the murderer's sister, the murderer's brother, the murderer's other sister, the murderer's best friend, the murderer's sister's sworn sword, the murderer's hand, the murderer's sister's boyfriend, the murderer's sister's cousin, the murderer's sister's right-hand man, the murderer's sister's uncle, and a bunch of random fucks. Honestly, who would be this goddamn stupid? This is who should be on the Great Council. One, Yara Greyjoy. Two, the Prince of Dorne. Three, no one fucking else. No one else sitting there was aligned with Amelia Clark and cares about justice. The only reason Grey Worm should have called these people together is to red wedding them all. Anyway, somehow Tyrion, a man who conspired to kill Grey Worm's queen, and despite being told to shut up many times, won't shut up. He tells Grey Worm that it's not Grey Worm's decision to enact justice, but that of a king. I'm sorry, but Grey Worm has all of the power. It is his decision. He is effectively king, and I have no idea why he hasn't already slit Kit Harrington and Tyrion's throats and everybody sitting here. I mean, perhaps one could argue that killing Kit Harrington would bring on war with the 15 people left in the Northern Army, but honestly, who cares about killing Tyrion? Podrick Payne? Who else? No one alive gives a shit about Tyrion Lannister. Anyway, Grey Worm tells everyone to pick a king, and the show decides to shit on Edmure for a while, and then Sam suggests popular democracy, which everyone declares as absolute lunacy, despite the fact that the Ironborn and the Night's Watch effectively use this system. Oh god, and by the way, why is Davos a minor lord there? And what current positions do Wolverine and the Brand 9000 have? Oh right, fuck all. And don't get me started on Gendry. Did he walk up to Storm's End and say, Oh, hello, I'm Robert Baratheon's bastard and was legitimized by Daenerys Stormborn, the tyrant who just burned down King's Landing. I'll have my major lordship now. I'm sure that would go over with the Castellan really well. Anyway, Tyrion then puts forward the Brand 9000's name under the idea that stories unite us. And who has the best story? The Brand 9000. Oh gosh, this is painful. Let's assume that indeed stories unite us. Sociology of culture, Emile Durkheim, all of that, fine. How does this relate to the Brand 9000? His story is his story. Besides Mira, it doesn't affect anyone else. His story doesn't make a Dornishman suddenly get along with a Veilman. What's so aggravating about this is that the actual Middle Ages were filled with war despite common stories. I'm gonna go a little obscure here, but there was this little story that nearly every European believed. It was called the Bible, and it did jack all in preventing war and unifying people. But even if we jump to the ridiculous conclusion that a really good story can unite people, 
Does the Brand 9000 really have the best story? Better than, say, Sam, who joined the Night's Watch and traveled north of the Wall and killed a White Walker and kidnapped an incest baby and helped elect the Lord Commander and discovered where Dragonglass was and cured a sufferer of Grayscale and fought an army of the dead? Or Yara, who traveled the world and fought a shirtless madman in a dungeon and lost a King's Moot and then had to retake the Iron Isles? Or Davos, who was a smuggler and then saved Storm's End and then fought in half a dozen battles and then was drowned and came back to life and then helped resurrect Kit Harington? Or Wolverine, who traveled the world, was blinded, trained to be an assassin, changed her face, killed the Night King, and was also stabbed and came back to life. Man, a lot of these characters have been resurrected. Bran's story is without a doubt the most boring story in the entire series. In fact, it was so boring that he didn't even appear in Season 5. He is no one's favorite character. No one's. And why would Bran's story, which is essentially him being dragged to a tree, giving brain damage to a stable boy and being dragged back, inspire the Prince of Dorne to unify with the Vale. Does this man look like he'd be impressed by brain damage to a stable boy? Anyway, the crew votes and we get the highlight of the whole goddamn episode. Sweet Robin's single line. I. The Brand 9000 is chosen as king. And if this couldn't get even more ridiculous, Sandra declares herself independent. Ugh. Wasn't the whole point of this vote unity? I mean, despite Tyrion's story logic, I imagine a big reason that Bran was chosen was to keep the North in the kingdom. But now they're not, and this whole deal doesn't make any sense. I mean, now the Brand 9000 isn't even a subject of the kingdom he was elected to rule. I mean, is he even eligible to be king? And then there's the Vale. Didn't they declare themselves to be part of the North? That all got reversed? Then there's the Ironborn, who fought two wars for independence, and whose whole deal with Amelia Clark was for independence. Not to mention the historical desire for Dorne to be independent. Why would they suddenly want to be part of the six or seven kingdoms when they don't have to? Plus, Yara was somewhat reluctant to join because the Ironborn would have to swear off Reaving. With Amelia Clark gone, I guess they can go back to that, especially against the non-Six Kingdom Kingdom, the North. And they couldn't even get the name of their country right, the Six Kingdoms. You know, it was called the Seven Kingdoms before Targaryen Unity, and it was even called the Seven Kingdoms after Targaryen Unity without Dorne. Not to mention the Iron Isles are kind of an Eighth Kingdom, leaving the Kingdom with Seven effectively. There is absolutely no reason to change their name, except to piss off Yara, which this entire day seems to be dedicated to doing. And so, after becoming king, the Bran 9000's first act is to make Tyrion his hand. Tyrion, a man who by his own admission was horrible at being hand, a man who provided zero pieces of good advice to his last monarch, a man who has a very long list of betrayals and dead bodies, including his father, his lover, his best friend, and his queen. The Bran 9000 wants him, I guess because Tyrion built him a saddle once. And then Grey Worm, the man who holds everyone's life in his hands, the man who clearly wants to kill this imp who successfully conspired to kill his queen, just takes it. He lets Tyrion live for no discernible reason. I have no clue why Grey Worm just didn't pull out his dagger and cut Tyrion's throat right then and there. Tyrion successfully conspired to kill his queen. And then we get to Kit Harrington, who, for his crimes, is sentenced to join the Night's Watch, which still exists for some reason. Ugh, and how is this punishment for Kit Harrington? Kit Harrington joined the Night's Watch willingly in the first place, and willingly stayed after being offered a lordship by Stannis. He clearly doesn't think it's that bad. Plus, who's going to enforce Kit Harrington actually stays there? His sister's kingdom and safe refuge is directly south of the Wall, and his brother's is beyond that. Why on earth would Grey Worm ever agree to this deal? A deal that's not really a punishment and has no assurance that it would ever be enforced. Again, why not slit these motherfuckers' throats? Grey Worm is ceding power to a man who conspired to murder his queen and letting the guy who actually murdered her go. This is absolute insanity. Well, whatever the case, Grey Worm just angrily stares at Kit Harrington and then the Unsullied take off for Noth which, by the way, is famed for killing outsiders with butterfly fever. So, yay? At least as a last fuck you to Westeros, he's left all the Dothraki behind for them to deal with. Kit Harrington then says goodbye to his siblings, not bowing to the Queen in the North, but instead bowing to the King of a Kingdom that he spent a total of one month in, almost entirely as a prisoner. And Wolverine, completely out of character, says that she's going to explore west of Westeros. I guess the whole discovering that she was not no one but a Stark and wanting to protect her family was a load of shit. Instead, a completely random throwaway line from two seasons ago about asking what's west of Westeros takes precedence over everything. 
I'm only comforted by the obvious fact that very experienced sailors like the Ironborn have discovered nothing but ocean to the west, meaning that an inexperienced sailor like Wolverine is almost certainly going to die of thirst. So, yay! We then get to Brienne, who seems to now be the Brand 9000's Lord Commander, despite being sworn to Sandra, the Queen in the North. I'm not sure how that all works. Yeah, I know how it works. It's called oath-breaking. Anyway, we find that the readable portion of Sir Duncan the Tall's entry coincidentally ends exactly where the last Duncan Egg story ended. And for some reason, Sir Arthur Dane's entry has been completely altered since we saw it in Season 4. I guess Jamie retranscribed it with his left hand? Whatever the case, it still lists Arthur Dane as dying with multiple brothers at the Tower of Joy. And then we waste more goddamn time with Tyrion adjusting chairs, and then we find out that Sam Tarly is somehow Grand Maester. Sam Tarly, a man who forswore his Night's Watch vows, forswore his Maester vows, fathered children with a woman, took up lands and titles again, and who hasn't forged a single link. At best, Sam is an oath-breaking acolyte, and yet somehow he's Grand Maester. And somehow, Maester Ebros, who specializes in healing, is writing histories, which is perhaps why his shitty book somehow fails to mention Tyrion, whose kidnapping triggered the War of the Five Kings, who is hand for both Joffrey and Amelia Clark, and who killed Tywin Lannister. No matter, it's a chummy environment with Davos on the small council as Master of Ships. It's good times. Tyrion killed your son. And Bronn is there as Master of Coin, outdoing Sam with a lack of qualifications. No, seriously, it was quite horrific. This is what the world needed. A catatonic king, a failure of a hand, an acolyte posing as an expert, and a cutthroat running the finances. Mother, get down! Anyway, the Brand 9000 wants to locate a big flying nuclear weapon, which understandably troubles Braun, and we're left with bickering. And in our final montage, we have Kit Harrington coming back to Castle Black and being forgiven by his direwolf. They always come running back. Sandra becomes Queen in the North, with everyone remembering how to kneel, and we find that the big winner of all of this is Illin Payne. <laughs> she never got you, bro. She never got you. Congratulations, you beat her. And in our final scene, we find out that the showrunners don't understand how plant life works. Thank God it's all over. Do you think Kit Harrington is deserting in that final scene? Honestly, who gives a fuck? The showrunners clearly didn't. What an absolute disaster. Perhaps it was just rushed. They just needed more time, bro. More time. Wait, what am I talking about? I have a time machine! I can go back and change everything! Wait, Chad, are you sure you want to mess with the space-time continuum? Fuck yeah, bro! Let's do it! We can go back and fix everything! Hey, Talisa, go back to Volantis. It's ridiculous that you're walking around battlefields sassing kings. Hey, Locke, change your name to Vargo Hout, and if anyone asks you to go north of the Wall, don't do it! Hey Tyrion, don't send Podrick to the whorehouse. That would be really, really stupid. Hey Mira and Osha, stop arguing. What a pointless waste of time. And Osha, go to Skagos, why don't you? Catelyn, you better Stoneheart. Hey Littlefinger, ever heard of Jane Poole? Also, cool it with the jetpack. Hey Jamie, Tyrion lied to you about Tysha. Hey Aaron, Euron molested you. Also, you have a brother, Victorian. Also, Euron wears an eye patch. Hey, Doran, you have a son, a daughter, and a goddamn Dornish master plan. Get on that shit. Hey, Tyene, no one needs any bad pussy. Hey, Stannis, stop being a dumbass. You're the greatest general to ever live. Act like it. Hey, Varys, you have a friend named Illyrio, and there's this dude, John Connington, and you have a real cause, Aegon. Hey, Lyanna, I think her name is Sansa, not Sandra. Just saying. Hey, Wolverine, just... just die. Ugh, oh, there's too much to fix, and we only have enough plutonium for one more trip. I better make this one count. Hey, George, write the book. 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 Write book. Write book. Write book. Write book. Write book. Rye book. I can't believe it's finally here. The winds of winter. Oh man, this is gonna be so awesome. Read it to me, read it to me. Prologue. 
Moonlight glistened off the sellsword's blades as they crested the ruddy hill. Mud gripped their worn leather soles. Rybok, Rybok, Rybok. Rybok, Rybok, Rybok. Son of a bitch!